I'm going to get us started and um, people may be joining and that's fine. So I just want to welcome everyone. It's so wonderful to see all of you today. And um, this is our United Methodist Women's um, Spring event. We usually try to have some kind of educational event in the spring. And um, so today we're talking about and learning about uh, disparities in um, maternal health care. And United Methodist Women um, is an international organization and we have projects around the world. And uh, women and youth are our are, are primary focus. And we usually have some kind of subcategories of, of um, uh, topics that we're focusing on and maternal health is, has been one of them. And so I'm so excited that we're actually gonna make this happen. And um, so happy that Dr. Townsell is with us. So welcome everyone. Thank you for attending. And we're gonna start off, um, Julie Rush is going to start us off with a devotion and prayer. So go ahead, Julie. Thank you, Marilee. Um, first, from 1 Corinthians, chapter 12, verses 25 and 26. The way God designed our bodies is a model for understanding our lives together as a church. Every part dependent on every other part. The parts we mention and the parts we don't. The parts we see and the parts we don't. If one part hurts, Every other part is involved in the hurt and in the healing. If one part flourishes, every other part enters into the exuberance. Usually this passage along with the several preceding verses are used to exemplify the various roles within the church that are all important. However, we can also read these verses to exemplify the care which we are called upon to give one another, not only friends and acquaintances, but all. And then from John verse, or chapter 13, verse 34, let me give you a new command, love one another. In the same way I loved you, you love one another. We read this verse and recognize that we are called upon to care for all. Advocacy for the rights of others is a form of care and love. Join me in an attitude of prayer. Loving and sustaining God we give you thanks for your word and for the wisdom of our presenter today. We pray that we may listen and be stirred to action and advocacy for others in reducing the racial disparities in healthcare. Help us to discern and to do your will. Amen. And now perhaps it's time to introduce our speaker. And we couldn't have, it doesn't seem to me, uh, a better targeted person to speak to the issues of maternal health disparities. Dr. Townsell's background includes getting a, an undergraduate degree at Howard University followed by an MD at the University of Southern Florida in Tampa, um, residency at Georgetown Hospital in Washington, followed up with University of Connecticut uh, Master in Science. And as she has gone about her work, her overarching career goal is to eliminate disparities in maternal and neonatal health outcomes, particularly with regard to racial disparities. And in line with this goal, both her clinical work and her scientific 
uh, research endeavors to focus on marginalized populations and eliminate the structural and clinical care inequities that produce health outcomes, which are disparities. Right now, she's at the University of Michigan, and in her clinical role, she provides care for high-risk um, obstetrics patients. Um, and she also is the co-lead at the University of Michigan's Birth Center Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Work Group, and co-lead for the Trauma-Informed Care Work Group. So that's probably as much as you can process this early in the morning, but there is more. And if you want more, just let me know and I'll give it to you. But in the meantime, we'll let Dr. Townsell take the lead. All right, good morning, everyone. <laughs> it is so wonderful to be here. And I just wanna thank Margaret Punch for um, suggesting me and, and uh, giving me this opportunity to meet with you guys today. I'm just gonna share my screen. All right. Can everyone see that? Perfect. Okay, perfect. All right, I'm gonna make this smaller. And so I'll hop right in. If there are questions, feel free to just unmute and um, ask. Um, and then also at the end, certainly hope to have some great discussion and conversation. All right, so my focus today is to talk to you all about reducing bias in maternal care um, and kind of outline strategies for action that we can all take. I have no disclosures. And so some of the objectives that we'll um, tackle today, uh, we'll learn some definitions, review definitions of implicit bias, health disparity, and health equity. Um, I'll try to illustrate the current problem of disproportionate maternal um, deaths and mortality in the United States. And then we'll identify some of the underpinnings of these health disparities and potential solutions and strategies to combat this um, epidemic. So let's start with some of these topics um, and concepts. So the first would be implicit bias. And the basic definition of that is just an unconscious attitude um, or a stereotype that we possess. Um, other definitions, one stated here is the automatic reaction we have towards people based on past learning and ex um, expectation. Um, and so really, I think when thinking about maternal mortality and the maternal death, um, epidemic that we have in the United States, we have to sort of start with ourselves and start with the systems that are in place and how we got here. Something else that I want to make sure that we all understand before we talk, jump into the topic is exactly what is a health disparity? It's a particular type of health difference that is closely linked with social, economic, and environmental disadvantage. Um, and so when we think about, you know, how, how do health disparities arise? they arise systematically um, and generally are experienced greater in certain groups, such as racial and ethnic groups, which is what we'll talk about today, but also in religious groups. Um, it can be based on your gender, your age, your mental health status. And so these are all issues that we kind of have to think through as we, as we talk about this topic. And then last, but certainly not least, in contrast to a health disparity, I also wanna make sure we understand the concept of health equity. So the major tenet of health equity is that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. Um, it requires that we remove obstacles to attaining um, adequate care. So that might mean social issues like poverty or discrimination. Um, and I like this illustration because, you know, there's a little bit of confusion between what is equal and what is equity. And when we look at the pictures, we see that in a system that stresses equality where everyone, it's like a one size fits all approach and everyone gets the same care, um, there's still people that are sort of left behind, unable to see and un unable to obtain, um, to attain the view that they need. And so when you look to the right of the screen, 
um, when we think about equity, we're now talking about what does each individual need to attain their optimal health outcome. And so for some individuals, that's maybe not a lot because perhaps they you know, have the resources and have um, the means to attain good health. But for others who perhaps um, have different struggles or different barriers, uh, they need additional supports. And how do we get the to the individual the support that they need? I think that's where healthcare needs to be moving toward. And so those definitions are important to understand as we dive into the current issue of maternal mortality in the United States. And so this is just an image that shows that the United States maternal mortality rate is rising while maternal mortality continues to actually drop in developing um, the developed world. And this is just kind of another illustration of that, but you can see that many of the other countries that we sort of compare our healthcare system with are really doing a lot better than we are when it comes to maternal mortality. And you know, once we hit 2000, something, something sort of switched. And even before the 2000s, we weren't decreasing. We were still sort of staying stable and with a slight rise. And so what is really underpinning some of that? When we look at the entire world and sort of reasons why women die in childbirth or either postpartum, the major causes um, are things like bleeding too much after a baby is delivered, so hemorrhaging, or women having high blood pressure problems of pregnancy, and even infections. Those account for the majority of deaths in the developing world. And those are preventable deaths. But when we look at women dying in the United States, the causes are different. We know that women who um, you know, encounter high risk and um, high death rates in the United States are more likely to have things like high blood pressure problems of pregnancy and other medical conditions. And things like um, infection and hemorrhage, those are less likely to cause death. And so a large part of what we try to do in obstetrics today is really educate women about entering pregnancy healthy, making sure they're on safe medications when they're pregnant, and making sure they have the right care throughout their pregnancy to ensure a safe outcome for the mom and a safe outcome for the baby. So now we understand what's causing some of these deaths, certainly medical conditions that women have that sort of increase their risk, those could be risk factors. But um, I think another aspect to understand is when are women dying? And so when you look at this graphic, we find that the majority of women are actually dying either during their pregnancy, the day that they deliver, or immediately postpartum. And so we certainly have women who die beyond that period of time, but the majority of women die when they're actually accessing care consistently during their pregnancy. And so these are women who should be having consistent touch points with their doctors, um, you know, while they're in the hospital, the day they deliver, they should actually be, you know, in a birthing center or in a hospital where someone is actually looking over them. And then the week after they deliver, there certainly should be touch points um, and education provided of warning signs so that women know to come back if there's a problem. And so before we launch into the who and the why of disproportionate rates of maternal mortality, I would actually like to hear from the group about what you think is driving health differences in maternal mortality, who you think is impacted the most and what factors you see playing um, a significant role. And if anybody wants to unmute, this is a, a good time. I think the fact that we don't have universal health care must make a difference. Certainly, and many of those developed nations that we talked about, they do have universal health care. Um, and you know, certainly access and re removing the barrier of insurance um, is certainly an issue and a factor. So we've been hearing a lot about underlying conditions uh, in relation to COVID. So I'm assuming that that's very true in other issues such as maternal care. And so um, I'm thinking of, you know, in, in terms of racial disparity, just the stress of, of living in a country where you're discriminated against is, is probably part of an underlying condition. 
Certainly, and we'll definitely talk a little bit about underlying conditions and how those impact outcomes. But that's definitely a good point. Um, I noticed you had a you had a large um, part of the pie was cardiovascular, and um, I, I'm, these are outcomes for everyone, not racial. Mm -hmm. And I wonder um, if that might be related to the higher level of obesity we have um, in the United States compared to other countries. Yeah, so that has certainly been um, identified as one of the key factors as to perhaps why there are so many additional underlying conditions amongst our population as compared to other countries. And so, you know, simply being obese puts you at higher risk of having cardiovascular disease or in, um, incurring one of those pregnancy related cardiovascular problems in pregnancy. So um, certainly an issue. I feel mm -hmm. like, you know, I, I was not surprised as we went through the graphs and it showed the increase and it showed the disparity between other developed nations and ourselves. And I was kind of like, okay, I get it. And then when you showed the, the, the graph of the, surf, the pie chart of um, infection and hemorrhaging as primary drivers of uh, mortality. Got it, got it. But when you got to what is happening here in the United States, all of a sudden I felt like, oh, oh, I don't really understand this issue. There's, there's such variety. Um, and I, cardiovascular for young people, young women, um, seems puzzling. But mm -hmm. anyway, yeah, and I, I certainly agree, right? So when a woman comes in who's 24 years old or 28 years old with her first pregnancy or second pregnancy, we certainly don't think of that woman as being at risk for having a heart attack or having a stroke or having high blood pressure. This should be a woman who's early in her life, who's healthy. Um, but I'll come to talk about some of the social determinants of health in some ways that patients and that um, individuals just aren't as healthy as they should be even at an early age and don't have all the access to the things they need at an early age that puts them behind the eight ball um, and increases their risk of having some of these conditions earlier in life. So that's, that's certainly um, a really good point to, to point out. I'm going to keep going. Oh, no, go ahead. No, go ahead. I think I also see that there must be an education component and that the act of becoming pregnant and having a child is considered so normal, quote unquote, that not everyone goes to their pre-birth sessions with a doctor. Not everyone even finds a doctor to the last minute and many people still home birth. And they just say that this is all natural and you shouldn't have to see a doctor. You shouldn't have to do all, all these invasive blood tests, et cetera. So that to me is a big component is the education. Right, um, and we know that you know, 50% of pregnancies are unplanned. And so it's hard to come for a pre-pregnancy visit when you haven't planned your pregnancy. And it's not that it's not wanted, it's just that it's unplanned. And so you just, you've missed that opportunity to make sure that your health conditions are under control. Anyone else before I move on? Oh, poor nutrition is a factor. Yeah. Not just during pregnancy, but even before that, throughout uh, the woman's life. I would certainly agree with that. Can I throw in one more? I was um, thinking about environmentally, the, mm -hmm. the pollution in our environment, the plastics that are breaking down in our environment related to the amount of goods that we consume. Um, all those things are contributing um, to everybody, I think is, is to poor health for everybody. And, but, um, obviously disproportionately for, for different groups of people, but I, I think it's, it's just, not, it's just not good all around for all of us. Yeah, I would certainly agree with that. And there's a growing body of literature and understanding of how your environment, sort of where you live, where you go to school, all of those aspects really um, contribute to your health outcomes. And so if you can think about you know, an inner city environment, well, that's gonna be much more pollution 
than someone who lives in the suburbs or someone who lives next to a wastewater management. So, you know, like where, where are you able to live and how does that impact your, your health? Certainly. All right, so let's talk about maternal mortality. So as you all alluded to, um, you know, we know that there are differences in um, the maternal mortality rate here in the United States, as well as in other developed nations. But when we look within our country, we know that there are differences um, in maternal mortality by race. And so when we think about, you know, who's at risk, we know that Black women are three to four times more likely to die during or after childbirth than white women. And really, when we think about many of our racial and ethnic groups, certainly historically, we've thought of our Hispanic patients as also being at increased risk. But when we look at sort of all of these different nationalities and all these different, um, different racial groups, we see that our Hispanic population is actually doing as well as or slightly better than our white counterparts. Um, but it's really our Native American or Indian um, Native uh, American uh, patients and our African American moms that are really having the highest rates of death. And both of those groups, again, are kind of like three to four times higher than um, their white counterparts. And so I want to take a second to share a couple of stories with you guys because I think. You know, when we think about education, we think about nutrition, we think about economic status and where, where individuals live and how that impacts maternal mortality. But I wanna share a couple of stories of individuals who didn't have any of those barriers, but still continue to um, really struggle with their pregnancy and how they were treated um, and struggle with their outcome. And so the first is someone that you probably are well aware of, um, this is Serena Williams, and she's known as this amazing tennis player, uh, world-renowned, multiple records, um, certainly should have access to ex excellent care, certainly should have, you know, nutrition and have great housing, and, you know, none of this should really impact her, right, because she should be excluded from this. Um, but when Serena Williams was pregnant, she came into the pregnancy knowing that she had had a blood clot in her lungs before, a pulmonary embolism. And she had told her doctors, gee, this is my history. Um, and I just want you guys to know that I've had this history. And we know that pregnancy actually increases your risk of having those types of clots. And so when she delivered, when she went in for her delivery, um, after she had her baby, she had to have a C-section and for multiple reasons. But after her surgery, she said, gee, I feel short of breath. I feel very similar to how I did when I had that blood clot. Um, and she initially was told, oh, you know, you just had a surgery, like it's a lot of recovery that you have to go through, you know, we'll keep an eye on things. Um, but she pushed and she pushed and she pushed and ultimately they did do some imaging and they found that she had a blood clot in her lungs. Um, and, you know, Dr. Punch and I know that women die from those types of things and it's hard you know, if Serena Williams has to advocate for herself to get the right imaging and to, to make sure that she's taken seriously when she has a concern, what do we think happens to women who don't have that type of status, right? So another person that you might be well aware of is Beyonce. Um, Beyonce, well-known singer, actress, et cetera, um, recently pregnant with twins. She too, um, you know, became pregnant, should have all the access and no barriers, et cetera. She went and she was short of breath and not feeling well um, and was ultimately diagnosed with high blood pressure problems in pregnancy or preeclampsia. She's a fit woman, she's young, she you know travels, she does all of these things, but it can happen to anyone and it happened to her. Um, and so I think when we, when we think of, you know, how is this happening at these younger ages? What's happening? You know, it's it's really unclear, but it's it's important for us to know that the face of preeclampsia and the face of some of these conditions in pregnancy, there are any of us in all of us. Another um, individual that I just wanted to share about is Dr. Um, Shalon Irving. She was a CDC expert, so well educated, um, and she died postpartum. She herself also had a C-section. She went home and 
you know, checked her blood pressure, wasn't feeling well, had a couple of um, nurses actually come visit her in her home. And they saw that her, high, her blood pressure was high. She ultimately went into the hospital a couple of times for evaluation, but was sent home and later died in her home. And this is a CDC expert who actually studies maternal mortality. And so this happened to someone who knew the risks and knew all of these um, disparities and still couldn't overcome um, the epidemic. And then the last individual I want to share with you is a person by the name of um, Dr. Shanice Wallace. She was a pediatric chief resident. So again, well-educated, worked at a hospital, understood disparities. Um, she underwent a C-section, had several complications during her um, pregnancy course and ultimately passed away. She also had high blood pressure problems with pregnancy. Again, a very young woman, otherwise healthy as far as we understood it, um, but unfortunately who died. And so when we think about why we see these racial disparities in maternal morbidity and mortality, certainly we can look at some of the- Here's what I found. Oh, sorry. Certainly we can look at some of the factors, social and um, you know, environmental and you know, nutrition and education and all of those things. But then we have to also contend with, there are women who are black who are dying or having higher rates of adverse outcomes who have all the access. So really what is the issue? Um, and so I wanna just talk a little bit about um, some of those concepts. And so one of the things that has come up consistently is, well, are Black women sicker, right? Like, is it that they have more underlying conditions and that's why they pass away at a higher rate? Um, and so I just want, you know, this is like a, a research study, but I want to break it down a little bit and just say that on the right, on the left side of the screen, these terms like preeclampsia, eclampsia, abruption, these are terms, these are all conditions in pregnancy that can lead to death. But you know, if we identify them early, we should be able to prevent the death. Um, and so a preeclampsia is just a high blood pressure problem of pregnancy. And then eclampsia is when a patient has high blood pressure, um, like preeclampsia, but also has a seizure. Abruption is when a patient has bleeding behind their placenta. And then the placenta previa is when the placenta is over the cervix, where the baby can't come out that way, so they need a C-section. And then lastly, we have the postpartum hemorrhage where women bleed too much. And so what we know is that when we look at um, black women and white women, we know that black women tend to have slightly higher rates of preeclampsia, eclampsia, abruption, and placenta previa. They tend to have lower rates compared to white women of postpartum hemorrhage. But these rates, you know, maybe a 20% increase, six, you know, 60% increase, 10% increase. Um, so overall, um, very similar rates um, to white women of some of these conditions in pregnancy. But when we look at the death rate or, or you know, the mortality rate associated with these conditions, we see that black women are dying you know, three times as often or twice as often as white women who have the same condition. So why is that? It's, it doesn't seem like the difference is you know, attributed to the fact that black women have more of those of those outcomes, because we don't really see, you know, we don't see that women, black women have twice the rate of preeclampsia and so are dying at twice the rate. We see that they have a slight increase, but are dying at a significantly higher rate than white women. So I would contend and I would say that, you know, it's not that black women have more sickness or have more, um, you know, underlying conditions, um, that doesn't seem to explain the health differences that we are seeing. And then the other thing that comes up often is this idea of education um, and the pregnancy related mortality rate, that's the PRMR that you see there, um, it's actually significantly higher for black women who are highly educated. So, you know, black women are the, the women in purple. <clears throat> and as you go on, you see that Black women um, that have a college degree or higher tend to have significantly higher mortality rates compared to um, white women with the same level of college education. So consistently, even though you know 
we see that Black women are becoming educated, that doesn't seem to protect them in any way from dying in pregnancy. So these health disparities don't seem to be due, again, to a lack of education or be due to the fact that perhaps Black women are sicker or have these underlying conditions. There seems to be other factors that are really contributing to this um, disparity. And to the point of many, um, these social determinants of health are um, factors that we think really do impact um, maternal health for the, for the larger community. Certainly issues of finances and your neighborhood and sort of having you know, the housing in the right, in the right environments, um, your literacy and understanding of your healthcare condition and what you need to be doing about it. Certainly, you know, nutrition and having access to healthy options is important because we know that obesity increases our risk of several um, healthcare related issues. Um, but I think when we think about the context of community, um, discrimination and some of the structural issues in our society, I think, you know, no matter how good your insurance is or what your housing status is, some of those things you just can't overcome. And so I would submit that many of the issues that we're seeing when it comes to health disparities really relate to racism, structural racism, and many of the healthcare um, bodies within, the, within this, the country have identified structural racism as an underpinning of some of these health disparities. So what do we do now? We know that there are these health inequities, these health disparities that are present, but how do we overcome? How do we get past um, racism's impact on pregnancy outcomes? And so as Dr. Punch knows, we have very you know, elaborate strategies from a healthcare perspective to overcome some of these strategies. We need to expand Medicaid and we need to extend ex um, insurance coverage so that everyone has at least basic access to the, to the care we need. Um, we need to think about confronting things like bias and stigma um, so that patients really don't feel burdened to come to the healthcare system, but they actually feel empowered to go and get the care that they need. And then we also need to think about, you know, how do we get more physicians and nurses and doulas who look like the patients that we're seeing, right? We don't want the entire healthcare system um, to not reflect the population that they're caring for. But on a more simplistic um, approach, I think is really thinking through a couple of these strategies. From the community level, I think each individual can just educate themselves be more self-aware, become an ally, listen, and advocate. And to do that, I think we start with our education, right? So coming to talks like this, exploring some of the ideas that are um, underlying the disparities that we see. And that starts with perhaps reading a book, right? Or just educating yourselves on the perspectives of others. And so these are some of the books that have come out um, and that have um, sort of been touted as places to start to think differently about some of the social injustice that we have been seeing. The next thing that we can do is we can identify our own biases. Each of us have some sort of bias, like we, we just do. Um, it's inherent and it's insidious and we don't often see it ourselves, but there are some ways, and these are some examples of um, free sort of assessments. And so the first one is like an implicit bias module that just goes over, well, what is implicit bias? And, you know, what does it look like? How does it manifest itself? And this is just something that you can Google online and kind of work through. And then the second one is an implicit association test or a way that you can kind of test yourself to see, do you, how do I have any implicit bias? Um, it's through Harvard University and it's something that anyone can access and take. The next is to think about, well, how can I be an ally? How do I support individuals who maybe, you know, I don't look like and I don't have their experiences, but that I wanna help and support. One of the things to do, and this is sort of just a little checklist of things, is just to take on the struggle as your own. 
sort of see and perceive some of the struggles that individuals have um, and think about ways that you can support um, and push for the agenda to dismantle some of those structural issues. So stand up even when you feel scared. When you see something, say something. I think we've all heard of that term. Um, think about the privileges that we all have. I mean, even myself as a physician, I am privileged to understand and know some of the consequences of becoming pregnant while being an African-American mother in the United States, but I wanna share that information with other individuals in my community who don't understand that. Um, and then acknowledge that while you too feel pain, the conversation needs to be central to the individuals who are at highest risk. And so we wanna continue certainly to make healthcare safer for everyone, but we wanna to try to stay focused on really bringing the gap, closing that gap so that everyone is having similar outcomes. Lastly, we wanna be able to listen, right? So it sounded like many of, you know, Serena, she didn't feel like she was heard and she's Serena Williams. So if we can't hear Serena Williams, how are we gonna hear our community members who, who we don't know? Um, so I'm challenging certainly my colleagues and other physicians, but also individuals in the community to listen to women and to make sure that we're hearing women when they have a complaint. And then lastly, you want to make sure that you're being an advocate. Again, you want to speak up when you see things that aren't right in your community, when things seem discriminatory, when practices seem to exclude individuals. Those are ways that we start to break down some of the structural issues in the society. Um, lastly, I just wanted to share a couple of um, organizations that are doing a lot of this work on the ground. Mothering Justice, um, Black Mamas Matter Alliance, the National Birth Equity Collaborative, the March of Dimes. These are all um, groups that, you know, if you are philanthropic or if you want to support in some sort of way, um, these are groups that you can get behind and that are doing the work to dismantle these disparities. And that is all that I have. And I just wanted to be able to see folks and take some more questions and um, sort of engage you guys in more conversation. Yeah, Miss Jean. Courtney, you have a lovely daughter. And so obviously you had a successful pregnancy and delivery. Did you yourself um, encounter any sort of um, discrimination as you were pregnant and having your baby? So it's interesting that you asked that. So I will say um, with my first child, my son who's nine, and just a little bit of background, I am a, I, I played college basketball. I've been an athlete all my life. I'm a very healthy person or so. That's how I felt when I entered my first pregnancy at the age of 27. Um, and so I had my son and at the end, I myself developed high blood pressure problems and had to be delivered early, but had really good care um, and felt really supported. And so I felt like that pregnancy went very well while I was a resident um, and sort of going through that. During my second pregnancy with my daughter, um, I was very worried about developing a high blood pressure problem again, um, but did very well, got to, went beyond my due date and never had high blood pressure and then Two days after I delivered her, um, I wasn't feeling well. My mom said, gee, you look swollen. And I checked my blood pressure. It was like 170 over 100, something very high, not good, right? Um, and again, I'm a person, I run three miles. I do all of these things, but I don't know. It's an underlying thing that is intrinsic to me. So I called the triage line and I said, um, you know, I checked my blood pressure. I was at the grocery store and I think I need to, you know, I'm going to come in. Um, I didn't say I'm Dr. Townsell, I just, I'm a patient that I'm just calling and letting them know I'm coming in. And I was told, well, are you sure that the cuff was accurate? And, you know, because those cuffs in the grocery store sometimes aren't accurate and we can see you tomorrow. And I knew that wasn't right. And then I just said, well, I'm just gonna come in anyway. And sure enough, my blood pressure was high and I needed treatment and that was supposed to be there. But it's really difficult if I didn't know I needed to be there. What if I was a, a community member who thought that coming tomorrow was okay? Um, and so I think 
it happens to me, it happens to many people. And I'm just a near miss, right? I, I made it and I have my little girl and I'm here for my children, but not every patient has that experience. Miss Helen. I think it's the story you just told might be one illustration of it, but I was wondering if you could say more about how structural racism impacts maternal health outcomes, how that works. Mm -hmm. So it really starts with, and I actually, I had a little definition that I was gonna share, but was like, I don't know if I have enough time. Let me pull this up. Um, but I'll give you this just so that we can have a frame of reference. So the definition that is kind of put out there for structural racism is a system in which public policies, institutional practices, cultural representations, and other norms work in various, often reinforcing ways to perpetuate racial group inequity. It identifies dimensions of our history and culture that have allowed privileges associated with whiteness and disadvantages associated with color to endure and adapt over time. And the reason I wanted to share that definition is just to say that there's a lot of things that sort of perpetuate the structural issues, right? So um, how it impacts pregnancies, I think if you are a black individual in this country and you go to an institution where there's not a lot of black individuals, right? You're gonna go to a healthcare system where there's not many people that look like you, sometimes you can be fearful of, of going to a place like that because you can think, well, you know, I don't wanna be judged or I don't want to, um, you know, feel like I, I don't know what I'm talking about or I don't, you know, maybe they'll ask me questions and I don't know the answer. There's a lot of fear that patients sometimes have. Um, and I think, so one, one issue is just actually even going to a healthcare system or maybe you've gone and then you weren't treated fairly so now you don't wanna go back. And so I think that is in and of itself a little bit of a barrier. Um, and then I think, you know, where we put places, right? So, you know, we have a wonderful hospital in Ann Arbor um, and is that equally accessible to patients who um, have high risk issues, right? So maybe patients in Ypsilanti, are they, is it easy for them to get to Ann Arbor? You know, it costs money to pay to park when you come to the, the hospital, like that's not easy for some patients. I mean, I certainly have patients in my substance use disorder clinic that can't pay to park. So then it's a barrier for them to even come to their appointment. And so we support them and we have ways to help encourage them and um, you know, reduce the cost of parking, but that's, that's before they even get into the door. There's a barrier to get their care. Um, and so I think those are the types of issues that, that we're talking about, Marilee. So um, I'm just thinking about that interpersonal contact when a healthcare provider is, is caring for a person. I myself am a lactation consultant. Mm -hmm. I worked at St. Joe's and um, we had you know, a whole range of types of, of moms. And I, you know, just me entering the room to talk to a mom. Um, and I'm someone who's really trying hard not to, you know, be different with African American moms. But i it feels awkward. I feel like I'm invading their personal space. I I'm concerned, do they look at me as some white authority figure? So I'm I'm just more careful. I feel like I'm sort of walking on eggshells. And I want to give them the best care possible, but that and that's me. That's someone mm -hmm. I feel, you know, someone who maybe has a lot of biases when they're treating their patient. You know, how do they treat the patient? How are they listening at all? I feel like that's the that's got to be the point when right. these problems happen is that the patients are not being listened to, they're being disregarded or ignored. So, yeah, there's a lot of talk about communication and really how, like how we as clinicians and practitioners are communicating with our patients. Are we just talking at people and really not listening to them? 
And then how, if we really want to break down some of those barriers, how do we get comfortable really engaging patients who aren't like us um, in conversation so that they feel comfortable and we feel comfortable? Because, you know, that's also not easy. We may have the best intentions, but if people perceive there's an issue, um, then how do you overcome that? And one of the things that I have shared with others is, you know, when I was a patient and I didn't have my doctor hat on, I was just coming in as a patient, um, you know, it, it would have been really nice for someone to say, you know, I know that Black women are dying. And I know that that is scary. And here at X hospital or here at X clinic, we, we want to reduce those rates. And we want to work with you to make sure that you understand that we're here to support you and, and have you have a, a healthy birth and a healthy postpartum period. And I think really addressing things head on, because the, when I speak to other Black moms, certainly we have some support groups and little focus groups. Um, everyone just really wants to be heard and listened to, and, and they really want those issues addressed, right? So they really want people to really just say, we know that women are dying and we're going to make sure that you don't die. We're going to make sure that you have everything you need and you tell us, what are you afraid of? You tell us what you need. And I think that brings down the wall and the, and the fear, and then it allows more dialogue. Yes. What, what is the University of Michigan hospital system doing to address this issue? Yeah, so we have, first of all, one of the things that we did is kind of just come up with a, a statement, right? Just a statement that we can place on our website so patients know, number one, we know this is an issue, we want to reduce the disparities and we want not just reduce, but eliminate the disparities. Um, and it's a talking point that all of our clinicians can have so that they can start to have that conversation. Um, on our birth center, we've started to look at our rates of um, sort of high rates of hi hypertension and, and things like that. And so we're making sure that all of our moms have access to blood pressure cuffs. We're making sure that women come back sooner in the postpartum period so that we can make sure that, you know, their, their incisions are healed, they don't have infections, their blood pressure is controlled. Um, we're making sure that um, within our system, everyone is having bias training and we're making sure that the providers and the clinicians understand implicit bias and how to communicate. And so those are just a few of the things um, that we're trying to do. Wendy? Uh, for those of us who don't work in a medical field, um, is there specific advocacy? Um, for example, are you aware of legislation pending in our state, maybe, or um, uh, or um, you know things like that that might be coming out that we could be advocates for? You know, call our legislators and and you know, push them toward uh, good outcomes for that kind of stuff? So there is, and I actually am blanking on the name of the um, state senator that has just brought one of those to um, to the floor, but there's a momnibus or like a, an act at the um, federal level to expand medical Medicaid coverage postpartum, and many states have done that. Michigan has not done that. Um, and so that would be a place where um, I would say is, you know, would be a nice first step for us to expand Medicaid coverage so that we make sure that women don't lose their coverage and their access six or eight weeks postpartum or 12 weeks postpartum, um, because we know that women can, are continuing to be at risk for dying beyond that point. Um, but certainly there are other um, aspects of, and, and things on the table, and I could probably send them to Marley um, and kind of share those with you guys. Yeah, another, um, you did mention several groups that um, we could support financially. Uh, I've got the BMMA, NBEC, Mothering Justice, and March of Dimes. Because that's one thing you, that United Methodist Women do. We do, you know, finance things. So, um, and even just kind of as a thank you to you for speaking today, uh, I think we probably would be willing to make a donation to something. So would you you want to recommend an organization that we could make a donation to? <laughs> I have no 
I think whichever one you guys think is the best. <laughs> I have no idea. You know, I think they're all doing really good work. I mean, maybe considering a, more, a local one that um, might have a more impact closer to home. Is one of these that I mentioned a local? Does they do they have a local? So many of these have local chapters. I can. Um, I know that Mothering Justice uh, is local, um, but the MBEC and BMMA, those are, they have um, local chapters. And so if those are things that you, you know, think those are like more national, but have local chapters. And then certainly the March of Dimes has a local um, entity that can be supported. So I would leave that to you guys. <laughs> I, I will say I'm very involved in what we call telehealth or virtual care at Michigan Medicine. And that's, um, we're, we're very in, interested in expanding our ability to do what we call remote patient monitoring. So using, you know, making sure patients have good blood pressure cuffs in their homes. Uh, ultimately, we now there are Bluetooth okay. devices um, and we would hope to do that. And one of the things we are advocating for is for the reimbursement of that because it's been a significant barrier to get a blood pressure cuff. And it seems like, you know, it's not a barrier to someone that can afford $35, but that same patient who's worried about the $2 parking fee certainly doesn't have $35 um, for a blood pressure cuff. And some of the laws are crazy enough right now that we can't give a patient a blood pressure cuff because it's viewed as an inducement uh, for, for their loyalty to us um, to come. And we've been working on uh, advocating for some of the, that legislature to change. Um, and so it's a very interesting time in healthcare, I think, to try and look at how we can leverage all of this. I mean, here's a whole bunch of us who have learned how to use Zoom and uh, we can use that to provide care to patients in their home. And we're looking at models that mix prenatal care as in-person and virtual but we recognize that the, they need a blood pressure cuff. For us to feel safe, uh, we really need that. Once you can feel the baby move, it's not so important necessarily to be able to hear the heartbeat out loud, um, but certainly managing the blood pressure and managing those things are important um, and providing that support. Um, I think for me as an obstetrician, the, the work, the personal work on trying to understand my bias um, and, and what I, how I bring that is, is been very, you know, it's very challenging, but it's very important. And now when I'm taking a black woman back for a C-section and the dad looks at me straight in the eyes and says, I just want her to be okay, right? Like it, it puts a pit in my stomach that it didn't used to, that it should have for many years. Um, but now as Dr. Townsell, you know, is helping me learn through these processes to, to to say, yes, I understand what you're worried about and here's the things we're gonna pay attention to, hemorrhaging, you know, infection, here's the things that we're doing to minimize her risks of complications and also mortality. Um, and to acknowledge that is, is difficult because we don't want to face the fact that our patients may go into childbirth, which, you know, and, 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 and be at risk for death. Um, so it's very, very important that we do this work with ourselves and, and our communities to, to acknowledge it and, and move it forward. I certainly agree with that. I just added a few, um, just the, the main Momnibus Act that is um, out there and the two congresswomen that are supporting it, leading it. Hi, I have a question. Can, can you all hear me? Okay, um, so the, the stories that you told about Serena Williams and Beyonce and your own like sent chills down my spine. Um, I'm a black woman and I have two black daughters, one of whom is 24. So at some stage, you know, she's will probably have children. Mm -hmm. What do we do to teach black women to advocate for themselves? Because it never would have crossed my mind to like, question a medical authority and, and I'm an ed educated person, um, right. but it sounds like this is a real problem. What would you recommend black women do? Is there, are there 
resources that can help us to know the right questions to ask or things like that? Yeah, so I mean, the first step, I think, is making sure that you understand that, you know, you know, the, the, the disparities that are out there. And I think finding a practice, um, a hospital that is focused on eliminating that disparity. So when you meet a doctor, you know, making sure that they also are aware of the disparity and what are they doing about it? Like, like it was asked, you know, what is Michigan Medicine doing about this? To make sure that it's on everyone's radar. And so, and I think there's no, and there's no reason why, um, you know, physicians or, you know, um, midwives should take offense to that. And if they do, then that's probably not the right place for you to be. Um, so I think the first step is just making sure you're in a practice in, in a, a, a clinic or, or wherever that is taking this seriously. I think the next thing that I would tell um, Black women is that, you know, it's not enough for you to know, but it's important for your um, extended family and friends to know those risks. Because what happened with me is I, even though I know, you know, I do this every day, I didn't see myself um, getting swollen and I didn't see myself sort of looking sluggish. I didn't see that. Um, people around me saw that. Um, and I was kind of in denial about it, right? You just want to like push forward and be a good mom and do all the things, breastfeed, you know, all the things that they, that, are, that you want to do. Um, and so it's really important to have the individuals around you know about those risk factors as well so that they can say, hey, you know, you don't look like, you know, you, you're not getting around like you used to or, you know, something doesn't seem right. Like, why don't we go get checked and just let's make sure that everything is good. Um, and so you want to make sure that those around you know. And there's a, a nice little sheet. I'll see if I can um, share it in the chat. I think it's from the CDC of all of the um, warning signs that we look for. And so some of it is the swelling or the headache or the vision changes. Um, all of those things that you need to be aware of and the people around you should be aware of. So when those things come up, they say, hey, that's one of those things that we need to call the doctor about. And if they don't take you seriously, you, say, you tell them, well, this is what the sheet says, and maybe you need to go find a different place because you need to be heard. And so I think it just takes so much advocation for ourselves, unfortunately, at this point, um, and educating ourselves and the people around us to make sure that the outcome is good. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yep. I'd like to really advocate for, for mothers to really uh, pay close attention to their daughters after childbirth. Um, I have three daughters and, and a couple of my daughters needed to have immediate care. And if I hadn't been there to urge them to do that, who knows what might have ended up transpiring. So uh, moms are really important, even when, the, when your children are grown up. So, so true. So very true. Any other questions or comments? find that little warning. Are there some health uh, hospital systems that are doing significantly better than others? So, I mean, most of our data is at a national level, at a state level, and I'm sure there are some differences between hospitals. We've looked at, um, for example, women, Black women who have doulas seem to do better because it seems like the doulas are able to advocate for the, for the Black mothers. Um, and I think we're going to start to see how some of the implicit bias training and communication training amongst clinicians helps to reduce that number. Um, there was a recent <clears throat> study that came out that showed that maternal deaths are actually decreasing inside hospitals, but still increasing outside of hospitals. So even though the care is getting better when you come to the hospital, you actually have to get to the hospital, know to come to the hospital um, for your, your risk to be reduced. And so I think we're still needing to get that communication out to the community of when it's important to come back to get the care they need. But from an individual hospital to hospital, I don't know that we have that information or that people are willing to share it. <laughs> so is, um, I'm just wondering how this all compares um, from like a generation ago. I mean, I'm thinking when I was having my children, I, I don't feel like there weren't as many C-sections, for instance, there, 
you know, I, I don't think that there was as much preeclampsia or blood pressure issues. I, is this like a, is it snowballing? Is it kind of a generational thing that, that we just become less and less healthy in general? Um, I think it has to do with us becoming less and less healthy as a, as a nation. Um, and then I think it has to do with, um, you know, some of these issues on a society, on a societal level, you know, persisting and sort of not really getting better. Um, but I think it definitely has a lot to do with, you know, our day-to-day -day sort of environment. I, you know, it's multifactorial is what I would say. And there's not really one thing that we can kind of point to to say, well, maybe if we just fix that one thing, um, you know, things will get better. Even if we have a, you know, a less racist society and we, and we remove many of the barriers, there's still going to be, you know, a need to continue to work through closing the gap completely. Is, is our um, maternal mortality rate for white women pretty much the same as in Europe? Or is there a gap there too? So it is slightly, so our overall numbers, when you look, I think ours is overall like 12 per 100,000. And many of those countries are like seven or six per 100,000. And so I think when I looked at um, our white, population. Let me just get the number again. It was 13. So it's still higher than the developed nations, but I think incrementally higher is, is are those um, populations of color. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we still have work to do overall. I'm curious about the Latinx community. How, how does that compare? Yeah, there was a slide that showed that the Latinx community actually has um, at least mortality rates that are similar to white um, patients, or maybe even slightly better than white patients. And it's really the African American population and the American Indian um, population that have the worst outcomes when it comes to maternal mortality. And how do you account for that? You know, it's interesting. You would think that probably if there's a, a structural issue that maybe that community would also be impacted. Um, I haven't done as much extensive research in that population, um, so I can't say exactly what, what, why we see that difference or why we see that that population does a little better. I think the other part is, you know, I, I trained with, uh oh, that's the little one. Yeah, come here, mama, come here. Okay, come here. Um, you know, when we think about um, different populations of individuals, you know, when you think about Latinx, that's such a broad range, right? So Latinx communities could be, you know, individuals from Cuba, from South America, from Mexico, from, from so many different places. And so you have a broad, a broad sort of landscape of what those individuals look like. Um, and, and sometimes if it's not apparent that someone is Latinx, maybe they're born here, then maybe they don't have the same barriers that someone who um, speaks Spanish and otherwise um, has additional barriers may have. And so I think that may have something to do with it. My speculation. I definitely appreciate all the questions. Oh, uh, Ms. Debra, did you have a question? Yes. Um, I was wondering um, in terms of um, uh, studies, I mean, I, I know it used to be that, you know, it was mostly white men that were in studies. So therefore they knew the most about white men because they, mm -hmm. you know, they had the most data. And I was wondering whether that had an effect, you know, that, that um, you know, that you just didn't have as much data and therefore there might be some factor some tests mm -hmm. you should run or pay more attention to or something that you weren't doing because you didn't, you know, you didn't know. I mean, you, you didn't have enough data to even know. Yeah, I think, you know, I think we're seeing the effects of historical issues with research, right? So we know about Tuskegee experiments and we know about all of these things and that's really still ingrained in the African-American community. 
you know, even though we're trying to overcome a lot of that stigma and a lot of the sort of, um, I don't know, just the n mistrust that I would say that is prevalent, um, we're still, we still have a ways to go. And I think when you, when you have a large study um, and patients who already feel like there's discrimination, already feel like they're marginalized, um, you know, they don't trust coming into that study. They don't trust that you're giving them the thing that you're saying you're giving them. They don't trust that it's not gonna make them sick, even though you said it's a placebo. You know, there's much of that that, there, that still needs to be worked on. And so when we think about even things outside of pregnancy, like breast cancer, um, much of the much of the research we have is in white women. And so when, when black women come with triple negative breast cancer, we're still not really able to have this, the right treatment plan or, or things that can kind of get them to have a longer life expectancy because we just don't have enough black women entering into those trials. So excellent, excellent point. So is that sort of related to some of the issues with or have had with COVID where there, there was more uh, hesitancy with some of the, the uh, communities of color because they felt like they'd been treated badly before? Yeah, I think it's more just like hesitancy because of mistrust of, you know, was it too fast? Like, were there enough black people in the study? And, and is this going to work for me? And is this really going to make me sick? And uh, just a lot of misconceptions that I think are prevalent in the population. But I think it might be easier to trust someone who, who looks like you and created it than someone who doesn't look like you and you're not sure. Um, because of all the other interactions and experiences you've had in your life. I think that is just um, a significant barrier. I have my, my husband, I'm still, he's just finally getting his shot today. And, you know, it's been available. I was like, babe, you got to get your shot. You got to get your shot. And he's just not, he's been very hesitant. <laughs> and I'm a doctor and like, trust me, you know. Yeah, and there were some very clear examples of people doing studies, so to speak, that involved African American patients that were were just wrong and dangerous and bad. And a corgi that's upset that the grass is getting cut. Are you making a mess? Sorry. I'm sorry, Margaret. Were you saying that there were studies that were well? They they were they were not treating syphilis, known syphilis, in oh, in right. in black people in prisons, and it was just very clearly, you know, it was horrifying that that was allowed to go on, and and uh, it's generated you know a community of mistrust, and I think it's very challenging to overcome. Um, I, you know, Dr. Google is very challenging uh, for those of us in healthcare today because people get information from Facebook and other sources of information. And I had a losing argument with a 27 year old pregnant woman yesterday about the COVID vaccine because she's sure it's gonna cause infertility in her daughters who are three and five if she gets a vaccine. And, and we have been taking care of women dying of COVID with this last wave in Michigan has been particularly brutal with young women. And so we, we feel very comfortable now saying the vaccine is safe and COVID is not. And yet we're struggling because of the information that's out in the public hemisphere and she's done her research. Um, so, and that's, yeah. and that's a white woman without the racially you know, charged context of, of other things. And no, pregnant women were not included in the trials. Um, but we understand the science and the, the rationale behind it, and we use other vaccines in pregnancy uh, all the time. And, and so we just have to, you know, continue to try and get the right information uh, out and to, to challenge that. And I was delighted today to see an article in MLive even trying to debunk uh, some of this information um, so that it can, it can be, um, you know, that people feel safer with, with that information. Um, but there is more hesitancy. And, and, and also sometimes that hesitancy, as Dr. Townsville sort of pointed out, drives people out of the healthcare environment, right? So there were some very 
um, sad examples early in COVID of women who decided to have home births because they felt that would be safer than coming to a hospital um, and some tragic outcomes that ensued uh, as a result of that when we were doing you know, everything we could to keep people safe uh, in hospitals uh, from COVID. I dropped it. She dropped something. Okay, go get the dog. No, I don't want to get it. You get it. Any I other comments? <laughs> it's, it sounds like we need to encourage trust in our medical system. So we need to give examples to our to people we know that there's reasons to trust, right? I mean, we have to develop good trusting relationships with our health care providers. Um, and, and I think, Dr. Tumzel, what you said about being honest and upfront um, about what you're concerned about for your patients so they know you, you care, that's really important. I would also add to what um, Margaret mentioned is that there's beyond the syphilis trials, there have been like forced sterilizations and, um, you know, things like that. And so when you think about women being concerned about infertility, you know, it's not out of, it's not out of nothing and it's not out of thin air. I mean, these are things that have happened um, and it's really hard for populations and groups of people to really get over um, some of the things that have happened in the past. And the forced sterilization, I mean, there was even an example last year among the, you know, migrant uh, immigrants uh, in Georgia where there were women that were sterilized without their consent um, in America today. So it's, it's not beyond the realm of, of what's happening um, currently. And I think the other thing I wanted to touch on was uh, Courtney's point about um, seeing people who look like you. Um, in this country, the percentage of the population uh, and the you know, racial dis distribution of the population compared to in healthcare, especially in physicians, is very disproportionate. So especially black men are extremely underrepresented. Black women are very underrepresented, but black men are even, you know, very much more highly underrepresented in healthcare. And there's, you know, significant uh, challenges in trying to address that, uh, but, it, but just starting to acknowledge it and address it is important. Um, and the amount of debt that um, people incur today to become physicians can be crippling. Um, so I look at, at many of my finishing residents and they have, you know, two and $300,000 of debt. Um, and they've spent years in training and then as, as to, in school. Um, and then the years in training are paid well, but not paid at a rate where you can really pay down that kind of debt. Um, and so it's very uh, challenging to the point where many physicians are not encouraging their own children to go into healthcare. Um, and so we need to make sure that we continue to fund the scholarships and the support uh, that people need to, um, to achieve those kinds of roles uh, so that our patients can see themselves represented in the care that we offer. Um, I'm old enough that it was still a bit of a novelty when I was a woman obstetrician. <laughs> Um, and I, I had many patients who were like, well, I came to see you because you're a woman. And I'm like, well, I'm glad you think my ovaries make me a good doctor. <laughs> but, uh, but, but uh, it, it, you know, it, it's, a, you know, sort of a precious acknowledgement of the, of, of an increased level of trust that that provided um, in, in, in that. Um, and so we need to continue to strive to encourage you know, people in all walks of life to, to pursue these kinds of careers. And that's certainly one of my big focuses is mentorship and even um, high school level and beyond really starting early because, you know, um, just making sure that students understand the many opportunities that are ahead of them. Um, because if you come from certain areas or you know, in my family, I didn't have any physicians in my family. So there wasn't someone saying, oh, you should just, you know, be like uncle so-and-so or, you know, like your dad. Um, so sometimes when we don't see those things, it's hard to imagine yourself in those positions. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I would just like to thank you, Dr. Townsell, for giving us this chance for discussion and even more the content of your presentation. Um, lots of good aspects in terms of the personal examples in organizations to support a clear idea of the disparities that do exist, some encouragement for institutions addressing these issues, and some instructions in terms of our own families and acquaintances and what kind of information to be giving, what kind of information to be listening for. So thank you so very much. This is a, it's a very complex problem, more so than I realized when we were talking about this ahead of time. And um, I'd like to thank everyone who came today and participated. And especially no. Dr. Townsell. <laughs> Dr. Punch. Yes, thank you. And Dr. Punch. Yes. Yes, thank you very much.